Well, we, we were sent a code that we would give people. So uh, welcome to Envisioning the Future of American Art. Uh, my name is Lewis Burry. I'm going to be the, the moderator for this panel. Uh, I'll say a few quick words uh, by way of introduction and overview, and then I'll name and introduce all the panelists. I'll read all their bios at once, and then they'll take turns uh, giving their um, short five minute talks, and then we'll open it up for conversation after that. So uh, <clears throat> thinking when, when people think about the future of uh, American art, art in general, I think oftentimes it's associated in people's minds with um, forecasting trends or different vogues or fashions of the art itself, right? Um, so for example, um, in recent years, people have talked lots about immersive art, about further expansion of artistic canons, about NFTs is a, is a huge one, right? Uh, and I think that's important, but I would also say for me personally, for any consideration about um, art and the future, um, it's worth thinking about the material conditions under which the art is made, right? So what I mean um, in kind of broad terms is we know that we're current, currently experiencing and going to continue to experience even more so anthropogenic climate change, right? Um, in the United States and in other parts of the world, there's rising authoritarianism, right? Um, uh, even if the, the, there's petrocapitalism, it's, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of naming big abstract um, movements or forces, but it's not hard to imagine uh, conditions in the future where um, art as we think we know it won't continue to exist in exactly the ways we know it precisely because the material conditions uh, have changed. And so this may or may not be something that um, panelists address specifically in their own talks. But for me personally, that's an important question and consideration to think about when you think about the future uh, and art and what those effects might be and how, and, and I should say that I'm acting as though artistic trends and material conditions are separate things when of course, in fact, they always inform one another. You can't get at NFTs without the whole history of contemporary um, internet technologies. So that's my sort of approach to the, to the subject. I'm excited to hear um, from our four panelists Today, I'm going to uh, read their bios and then they're going to go, uh, they're going to um, talk for five minutes each before we open it up for conversation. So, uh, Natalia Anciso is an American Chicana Tejana contemporary artist and educator. Her artwork focuses primarily on issues involving identity, especially as it pertains to her experiences growing up along the US Mexico border via visual art and installation art. Her more recent work, covers topics related to education, human rights, and social, ju social justice, which is informed by her experience as an urban educator in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's a native of the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas and currently lives and works in Oakland, California. Marsha Annenberg is a conceptual artist. Her paintings, sculptures, installations, and videos focus on underreported stories in American media, concentrating on scientific studies and global warming. Annenberg's recent artwork deconstructs the underreporting of five major climate studies. In December 2021, she curated an exhibit entitled Earth on Edge at the Ceres Gallery, New York City. Dr. Klaus Jacobs, geophysicist, Earth Institute, spoke on sea level rise at the gallery. Jack Dardier is an American visual artist based in Seattle. She's best known for her testing series, abstract paintings that explore how materials interact with each other, respond to light, and change with the passage of time. She received her MFA in painting from the University of Washington, and her work has been featured in numerous solo and group exhibitions in the U.S. and abroad. Her paintings are in the permanent collections of the Esberg Art Museum, Denmark, Henry Art Gallery at the University of Washington, the Allen Institute, the Google Cloud Collection, the Bill and Melinda Gates Research Institute, Microsoft, and many others. And finally, Vernita Nemec also known by the performance name Vernita Incognita, is a visual and performance artist, curator, and arts activist based in New York City. She earned her BFA at Ohio University in 1964 and has resided in New York City since 1965. She's also known for her sofa, for her, she's also known for her soft stuff sculpture, collages, artist books, photographs, and installations. 
Nemec adopted the pseudonym Incognita, a pun on incognito, as a way to honor artists who have not become well known. So with that, I'll turn it over to Natalia. Um, sure, hold on. <laughs> Give me one minute. Um, yeah, so I guess we're just talking about our work, right? Um, I, like you mentioned, I am an artist and a visual artist and educator in the Bay area, um, originally from Texas though. And a lot of my work deals with their like visual records of like my family and the community, um, most often like the border culture that, um, I grew up in, um, in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. That is, so it's basically like the very tip of Texas. Um, and it's uh, very different. It's like a super, you know, it's just like a blending of two cultures. My family, like I'm fifth generation. So we were there before like it became Texas. Um, so I have, my experience is a lot different. Um, than a lot of people like up here in the Bay Area who um, are maybe like first generation. And so much of it is just like, it's just really like about, you know, my experience. And, and it started out like having to do a lot with the border and just like the, the struggles of, you know, growing up there and being like, being from here, but not from here. And, you know, like looking different, but feeling different. And so um, I explored things like, like immigration and, you know, like drug trafficking, people trafficking. And I did these things on, you know, those are like really heavy topics. And I, the way I approached it is I didn't want to be, because I've seen both sides. I've seen like the positive and I've seen the negative. Um, I didn't want to put it so much in like people's faces. Um, so I started like researching Baño Arte, which is basically like it emerged in the 1940s um, from Chicano prisoners and they're like drawings done on handkerchiefs and on like cardboard. And so that's the approach that I started taking. And what I did was I started mixing that with um, elements of the Weepil, which is uh, like an embroidered Mayan textile. And I started just like blending those two things together and touching on these issues, like these really heavy issues. Um, and when I moved to the Bay Area, I started working in schools. And so that kind of like changed the subject matter. And I started examining, you know, like the, the school to prison pipeline, um, just like a lot of my work being in the urban classroom. Um, and then, you know, then, then that shifted, I became a mother. And then, so I started, I kind of went back to like the border and, you know, the, the, that growing crisis around the U S Mexico border and the family separations and like, just how that affected me now being a mom and having two little ones and just like thinking like that, that could have been me, like had my family been, you know, a mile down, like that, that could have been me, that could have been my family. Um, I think I am going to share some images right now. So let me see if it'll work. Um, okay, hopefully this works. I'm just gonna scroll through these really quick. And then just tell me like if I'm taking too much time and I'll speed it up. Um, yeah, so these are like some of the first images that I did. So these are done on handkerchiefs. Um, I I did a lot of research like on on the lynchings that happened with the Texas Rangers and the Tejanos that were living on the border. And so these are watercolor and um, an ink. And I really liked, I found that I really liked working on the fabric. Um, it, it just had like so much meaning for me, like just, it made me think of like elders and then just like the, you know, the soft like, feminine type of thing. I, I felt like it drew people in, um, cause they saw like the floral and, and once they were in, we were able to have like these conversations, they would see like, Hey, there's a guy hanging from a tree. Like what's up with that? And so we were able to have like deeper conversations, but I, I felt like this is 
this was really successful in like, you know, just bringing people in. Um, and so this is, this image right here is like a, a more recent image. I went online there, there's like this, in Texas, there's like this militia and a lot of them are like retired, like military. Um, and they're not supposed to have guns, but basically what they do is like they hunt people down and they like take pictures. And it just reminded me so much of like those lynching images. And so I started like recreating these. So um, these are actual like photos that people take and like post online. Um, and then I just really, I really took off with like the fabric. I, I just really liked that, that, um, that material working with it. it just made me think of like home. Um, here's some more images and a lot of the stuff I get are like actual photos that you find online. Um, Maybe Natalia, one or two more images and then. Yeah. I'll just go faster really quick. Let me see. I'll just go to some of the more recent ones. So these are some of the more recent ones I started being around with installation. Um, and so this is like with the with the female uh, field workers. And yeah, that's really, this is like one of the newest, newer pieces. I'll just scroll really quick. So this is the newest piece that I did. And um, lately I've been just focusing on the whole COVID, um, issues with COVID. And that was a kind of like dedication piece to the people who have passed away. Um, several of my family members are, are in this piece. Yeah, let me stop screen share. Thanks so much, Natalia. Uh, next up is Marsha Annenberg. Hi, everybody. We have a really broad topic, the future of American art. So I need to start by saying that I'm not an art historian. By training, I'm a painter, a mixed media conceptual artist, and an independent curator. I wouldn't presume to know the future direction of American art, but I have noticed some trends as an avid gallery goer. I believe that my discussion of the future needs to start with the past and with Duchamp, his artwork called Bottle Rack, 1914, announced the arrival of the ready-made object as an art object declared so by the artist. Duchamp's influence of using a mass-produced thing as an art object can be seen today virtually everywhere. A new development is sculpture digitally fabricated yeah, by a lab oh. 3D printed polymer, biopolymer replaces the plastics of original 3D printing, a sustainable and biodegradable substance from the agua OHA project that creates artifacts from biological components that will degrade naturally. I see a great future for this form of sculpture. For a generation that has grown up on screens, virtual reality, a computer generated environment seems like a natural fit. I believe that video and virtual reality will continue to grow in the future. A greater question that what form art takes in the future is, since this conference is about the USA, Will democracy prevail in the future? My own artwork intersects with art, journalism, and climate activism. I believe that our national press is declining and with it our democracy. The most popular news network in the USA doesn't report climate news or on our climate emergency. If we look at a recent study compiled by the organization Reporters Without Borders, Although we would assume that the USA is in the top five of the world in press freedom, in fact, we are number 44. What does that mean? Number 44 in press freedom. How can this be if we are the leader of the free world? Why did our top climate scientist, Dr. James Hansen, participate in civil disobedience four times? Why are our scientists willing to go to jail? For the most part, you could only read about his arrests on environmental websites, not in national newspapers. What does this mean for the USA and the world? Why is our climate emergency underreported in our press? The Alliance of World Scientists declared a climate emergency in 2019 with 11,000 scientists. That number is now up to 15,000 scientists. And yet, the research group Media Matters revealed Less than 1% of corporate news programs 
covered our climate emergency in 2020. What does this discrepancy mean? My last three artworks have dealt with the underreporting of climate studies, the National Climate Assessment in It's the Agenda, Stupid, the Hindu Kush Himalaya Assessment called Hush My Kush, and the Emissions Gap Report called What the Gap. These works can be viewed on my website at www.manenberg.com. Sorry, I'm having trouble showing my screen. Yale study, Global Warming Six Americas, has determined that 33% of Americans are alarmed, 24% are disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. But when you add in the cautious, who are they? They're not sure if global warming is happening or what the causes are if it is. If you add them in, that number rises to 40%. How is it possible that 40% of the American public has no idea that we are in a climate emergency? How is that possible? This indicates that our democracy is in danger now. We export our music and movies and art to the world, but our population is being propagandized by a lack of information. Our news platforms are degrading. We must take back our systems of information and give our citizens a public media option. A news system that is supported by public dollars and not by advertising dollars. Corporate news has failed us. We need to restore a free press to the American people. The future of American art is inseparable from the future of our democracy. Thank you. Thanks, Marsha. And it looks like Vernita dropped out or was having connectivity issues. So um, next up is Jacques Chartier. Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about, you know, the future of American art and how artists what? today and in the future might engage with what's going on to the world. And it's, I think there are going to be artists like uh, Marsha who are making work that is really about all these topics. And there are other artists like me who are kind of like my political leanings that happens somewhere else. But in my studio, I'm trying to kind of focus and get that out of my head so I can make my work. And it's this weird schizophrenic kind of way of being in studio because it's like you're in a bubble. And um, it feels awkward at times. I'm working on a show that's opening um, next month and trying to focus with everything that's going on in the world has really been difficult. Um, so um, and it's hard to feel like it's justified to talk about art that's kind of not about any of that. But I'm going to try <laughs> anyway. So I'm going to um, show you a couple of images. Let's see. This is from a little while ago. Um, I've been making this work more recently. I'm an abstract painter, kind of a modernist, old-fashioned style of artist. And my work is really about making objects that create a, in, like, your first impression is a contemplative space where you're kind of brought in by the visual um, beauty of the work and trying to create a, a residence that's kind of like the way some music can kind of bring you into this place of contemplation or meditation. Um, but the work is really actually about things changing, impermanence and transience. These particular paintings, um, it starts off with, I make a small painting with materials that will disappear over time or change color. And I expose them to light in my window in my studio. And then I'm actually um, documenting them sometimes every day. And then I choose different. Each day is like a frame and it's still in a time lapse movie. And so I put them up on the wall where you can sort of see the transition of, of things changing. And for me, this is, you know, it's, it's my work as an artist, but it's also about a lot of that feeling you feel in the world of, things just changing and being impermanent or, um, you know, our bodies are aging, the world is changing. And that can sometimes be kind of paralyzing, but to try to embrace it and see the beauty in it. Um, and so let's try one other one. So I can find it. Hmm. 
So this is one that's going to be in my upcoming show. It's the same idea, but it's a little easier to see it. So the upper left corner is one hour after it was starting to be exposed in the window um, in my studio. And then progressively as the piece is getting faded out, eventually this will completely disappear. And I'll probably do a little time-lapse movie where you can see it um, quickly kind of changing and disappearing and it will go to completely white. That's at least in theory, that's what it will do. Um, so that's kind of what my work is about. Um, thinking about this talk, I was thinking a lot about like what, what is the artist's role in the, you know, the future of the world. And I, I think one thing that artists do is really bring a sense of being able to focus on something and have your, have your attention span brought to something and to, to just mull it over and turn it over. A lot of people are losing their ability to focus and have attention span on one thing as opposed to scatter shot on everything. I'm not very good at multitasking. I was really gra gratified to read an article that said, you shouldn't be good at multi multitasking. It's not the best way to use your brain. I think artists, um, we need to use our imagination to make our work. I think the world needs to use our magic. We all need to use our imaginations to imagine how the world's going to be in the future if we do change things or if we don't change things and try to picture those different paths and what do we want to see. So I, I kind of feel like that's, you know, not happening in my studio specifically, but it's happening as for me as a person in the world. So that's it for now. Thanks, Jack. Uh, and last but not least, we have Vernita Nemec. Uh, I'm inviting you to un unmute, Vernita. I accept. <laughs> Um, the last sentence of the description of this panel was how will art make itself open for all to see if we're not trained to understand it? How do we make people understand not only the art, but the issues that address it? And so what I wanted to address in these first few minutes is an idea I've had and that I've proposed actually to Francis is um, to have exhibitions of art in conjunction with these panels that have to do with current issues in the world. Because as they've said in the past, and I think maybe they say it now occasionally, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and before all of this madness that we're dealing with right now, before global warming was uh, a topic of concern and before what's been going on in, uh, in the Ukraine, I was dealing with junk mail in my art, and um, I went to a panel on recycling, and I said, where is the art? Uh, because artists have been working with trash and recycling for decades. And uh, so the organizers of the con conference pointed me to a table that, you guessed it, had little cereal boxes and milk cartons that were made by little kids transformed into cars and houses. And I said, wait a second. Artists have been doing this for decades. Please, why don't we have an exhibition? And I was very fortunate. I was able to persuade them to say, yes, it's okay, and to find a space for that exhibition. Actually, in a, um, uh, it was in Portland, Oregon, and their, their uh, recycling and their trash programs were conducted by the city. And they gave me this beautiful auditorium, and we had like 20 artists. We called it Art from Detritus. And I did a call for art. Uh, and I think one of the main purposes to do something like this is that it encourages artists to address the issues at hand through their art, if they haven't already. And it also helps to give, I think, more language to the people who are dealing with these problems so that they can reach the public more easily. I mean, museums and galleries reach only a certain group of people. I, uh, some people are intimidated. Some people can't afford to pay the $20, you know, to go to a museum. So um, I, I have, I, I feel something like that is very, very important. It would require funding. Perhaps a nonprofit organization could be formed. And maybe next year with this conference, we'll have an exhibition. I'm, I don't know if that will happen or not, but it could. 
And uh, since that time, I've done over 20 of these same exhibitions. They called, they're called Art from Detritus. And I've probably had hundreds of artists over the years. And uh, the last one was with the Sculpture Association, and it was virtual. And I think in addressing our future as artists, so much of what has been, um, you know, forced to happen by the pandemic, uh, all the virtual, all the digital, uh, even before NFT madness, we've had to adapt to stay in business, to do our art, to show our art. And I think that uh, this is going to be a, continue to be a part of our future. Um, and uh, I don't know. I guess that's, I, I think I've covered it all that I wanted to say right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mita. Thanks, Thanks to all our panelists uh, for their overviews of their practices and uh, uh, quick thoughts about um, what that might mean for the future uh, for their own work and um, in, in large senses. So let's open it up to questions. Uh, if uh, audience members in the room want to type in a question to chat uh, or if panelists have questions for each other and certainly if there aren't uh, anything, I can throw out a few questions to get uh, the conversation started. All right, I'll get the conversation started then. Uh, so one common theme that I heard in a few different, in, in different ways, but across uh, all of your um, presentations was about community and what's inside or outside, whether the community is something local, like Natalia was talking about, about her upbringing in the Rio Grande Valley, or um, whether it's Jack talking about well, I'm in my studio and that creates a little bit of a bubble from, from the outside. So like the, 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 um, what one's relationship is in your practice uh, to community and to the larger uh, world. And so I guess if, you, if anybody wants to speak about how their involvement in community, either, whether they're artistic communities or um, activist communities um, have... Uh, informed your sense of your work and your sense of the work's possibilities uh, going going forward. Can I just say one thing, uh, Lewis? I, I just recently curated a show called Earth on the Edge, and I had a speaker from the Earth Institute, Dr. Klaus Jacobs. And so uh, what I've managed to do is take my own personal work and bring it into the larger context of our climate emergency, which was really important to me, getting that all together and getting together 12 artists who address these same issues, which are like so critical and so urgent right now. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I apologize for right now, again, talking about myself, but thinking about how we relate to our community, it's, it's interesting in terms of an art, artists who do work that requires abundance of materials. For me, it's trash. Right now, I'm working on plastic because the, the gyres in the ocean are doing horrible, horrible things. There's just so much that I, I, we're destroying right now. But what I'm getting are donations of not money, but materials of... Uh, of you know, the kinds of things I need for my art. And so I'm, I feel like I'm already making people conscious of what what their, their use is and what their life is doing in a positive or a negative way to the environment. Um, and I, I feel like this communication is, is maybe the, the most important thing that we have to work on in, in these times is to make our art reach out to the people and talk to them in a way that they understand and that they can get absorbed in. That's so important. That's really major. Really major. Yeah. Classic is everything. You know, the yeah. water we bring to the lake, to the atmosphere. Right. Uh, you're, you're muted, Nick. I'm muted. I'm muted. 
Natalia. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that I think what Renita was saying was really, um, I like really related to it just because, you know, like my work in the community, like in the activist community, um, it's, it's super important that we like reach those communities, you know, or not like the activist community, but communities who, who like wouldn't, who don't have access to go to museums, to go to galleries, like for whatever reason, like that's one of the main reasons, like I, you know, I do art for myself, but I also do art for those communities to bring in, because I was a person, you know, I didn't go to museums or galleries and I didn't have, you know, like the money. And so for me, it's really important to work with especially youth um, because I know it's like really cheesy, but like they are our future. So they, you know, like they need to, to have like this exposure um, and then just, you know, use, use their voices and use, you know, that really mean the world to them. So I think that's really important. Yeah, your, your artwork is so um, um, engaging and so beautiful and it draws you in, but at the same time, it's so frightening, you know, because there's this dichotomy of imagery. And I'm sure uh, the public uh, the uh, must respond first to the beauty and then like say, oh my God, wait a minute, there's something horrible in here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was really funny. I think like having my um, grandparents see like the work because my grandma was like, oh, like it looks like my curtains, you know? So she like went in and she was like, oh look, and you did the embroidery too. And then she was like, oh, is this stuff? She was like, "What's this? Like, why is there a person?" And and then like we started talking, you know. And so I think like that's one of the things that is really like that I use to bring like people that you know like like my grandparents who like they're not going to go to a museum, like they're not going to go, you know. Um, and then like having for conversations, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the, the conversation about museums and who has access to them or who is likely to go to them or, or not is a really interesting one in light of this kind of, this kind of I almost want to say, power artistic. Is is anybody else getting an echo, by the way? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I I, I think I think it was we coming from... We can ourselves when we're not talking. Yeah, yet. maybe that's that's the way to go. And I, I'm, I'm going to make my quick observation and then uh, there's a couple audience questions. Um, one audience member wanted to grab the mic. And another one typed in a question in the chat, so we're going to get to those. And the simple thing I was going to say is there's recent trends, kind of what I alluded to um, in, in my opening thoughts about things I would call, I don't want to say para-artistic experiences, but that are not quite, they don't quite look like what we've thought of in the, or what was thought of in the 20th century is conventional artistic experiences. Easy, easy example, the um, immersive Van Gogh experiences right um and and there those are like transparent cash grabs right um but the high art equivalent would be maybe something like yayoi kusama's installations right where people who might not be the audience audience shows are uh they, they're drawn in by these things and they're, and they're attending them so uh just a quick thought and uh i don't see the mic uh request anymore. So um, please do re-request or type your question in the chat. And I see uh, Carol Feuerman uh, asks, when will figurative art return to American art? It's here. You can see tons of figurative art in the galleries in New York City. It's, it's all over the place. It's, I, I think it has a, it's in the Renaissance, actually. I see it everywhere I go in Chelsea. I was going to say, I feel like because I'm an abstract painter, I'm acutely aware of how much figurative art dominates over our abstraction in general. So maybe Carol has a, a more specific intent in that question. I'm not sure because I, that's all I see is figurative work. Yeah, Carol, if you want to follow, follow that up. Oh, I, Carol. Yeah, we're, okay. we're located because there's so much abstract um, work now. Um, in the galleries, where are you? Yeah, located? I, I know, I'm in Seattle. I know there's a ton of abstract work too. I just feel like what over my entire adult career as an artist, what I feel yeah. is the bulk of the top level curatorial attention tends to be more figurative or narrative of some sort as opposed to abstract. It's like people like stories. 
Like Carol's going to chime in here while we're on this topic, and then I want to make sure that we hear from Babs Reingold, also has been uh, waiting patiently for, for a bit now. But first, uh, I'm going to pass the mic to Carol. Turn on your mic, Carol. Uh, uh, yeah, Carol has it right now. Um, all right, I'm going to click on. Uh, uh, okay, one. Well, Carol, can you uh, can you speak? Okay, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I don't know if you can see me, but um, the pr I'm a hyper realist. And um, the galleries show the work, but the museums and cura curators and public art, does not they don't show it in this country. I have tremendous success in Venice, in Italy, in France, in every European country, in Asian countries, in all over the world. But in this country, it's not like in style. So I don't know. Um, I have a lot of collectors because collectors love realism, but uh, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Carol? Yeah. There are, there are a lot of things going on. I don't know about the rest of the country, but in New York right now where they're returning to people, from artists from the past and honoring them again and showing their work again. And a lot of those artists are realists. And uh, so I, at least in New York, everything is... I think become very pluralistic. They're, everything's going on, you know. It's abstract. It's conceptual. It's a performance. It's it's uh, environmental. Whatever you call it, art. It's art. Well, uh, maybe, you maybe can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that may be your experience. But I live in New York, and I show worldwide, all over the U.S., and um, it's not in my experience. So um, it may be getting better, but envisioning the future of American art, I think we have a long way to go um, with, with, with art. Um, I know that I'm on Instagram and TikTok, and if I show so much as the, 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 the rear end, the tush of a sculpture on TikTok, um, it gets banned. Yet I see some of my models who pose nude on TikTok, they can they can do it, and Instagram is very picky, also, and um, that's just to the general public. Um, I had a retrospective okay. at, at a museum. Carol? Yeah, Carol, uh, yeah. I'm going to interrupt just because we've got about five minutes left, and okay. Babs has been waiting very patiently. So I want to give sorry. her. No, 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 that's it's okay. Um, I think it's a, it's an important conversation to have about um, social media and. Um, censorship yeah. and so forth. But uh, let's hear from Babs uh, so that okay. it's time to give her concern. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, voice too. Thank, thanks so much. Babs. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, um, I'm an artist as well. And uh, I was wondering if uh, any of you have thought in terms of envisioning the future of American art as the big title here, overarching title of your a panel as to whether there were many different types of venues that you're searching for for your own art. Um, and specifically, I, I do address issues of climate change and poverty in my work and whether you're thinking about more, uh, just not the typical venues like a gallery or a even an alternative space, but other other types of venues so that you reach more people with your art. And then second, whether you've noticed when you're exhibiting your art, have you had uh, kinds of reactions that uh, causes people to think differently, to potentially take some action, or just to ha have an impression on them that changes their mind in some way? Okay, thank you. Babs, I wanted to just reiterate that uh, th I was making a proposal that actually in conferences such as this, that there be exhibitions in conjunction with them, because it would be a way of reaching larger audiences and giving artists an, a larger opportunity to, to speak to issues that are really of concern 
to to everyone, not just their own personal autobiographical artistic issues. Um, and I think that like when I do my recycling shows, I feel like it does raise people's awareness and uh, it makes them understand that they can do other things besides throw it away. They can reuse it. They can make it better than it was before by making it art. I, I, I guess what I'm what I'm thinking also is, do you see this as some playing some role in the future of American art? I guess that's the overriding question, and and possibly it's not. I don't I don't know. It may continue to play a minor role, uh, and I'm just wondering. I think the the question is, how do you reach so many people? What's the most people you can reach with an exhibit? And is there another way to reach people outside of the exhibit? So, for example, on the Lower East Side, every year there's an ecological festival. Um, going through the streets, they dress up in costumes. They go to all the local uh, gardens. It attracts hundreds of people, and it draws the public's attention to the question of the environment and what we're doing to the environment, which is so important. Because how do you how do you reach people to impress upon them that we're going through a climate emergency? I noticed myself uh, two years ago, I, I curated the exhibit called Endangered Earth. And one work that reached people really more than any was uh, a quilt that had uh, photos of the Daily News, the New York Post, and New York Newsday, where New York Newsday printed a cover about the National Climate Assessment. And the Daily News, New York Post only had Harvey, Harvey Weinstein on the cover and talked about Harvey Weinstein. So it talks about how what's the agenda of our press? What's important to our press? Because what's important to the press is in effect, what's going to be important to the people. So that's that's my viewpoint, and it, it did reach people. Having it on a quilt, a really 96 by 96 inch quilt, it did reach people, and uh, that was very gratifying to me. Natalia or Jack, do you want to add anything to what's, to what's been said? Um, yeah, I was recently, or before COVID hit, there, they started doing in LA, they started doing this big mental health uh, fair called like, We Rise. And they had a big, um, you know, it was focused on mental health. They brought in a lot of like celebrities, and a lot of, um, you know, like musicians. And they also had this big art exhibit. And people who wouldn't really go to that, like started going and started opening their eyes to like a lot of different, you know, like mental health issues. Um, and what drew them in, you know, like or not was like having these celebrities there and having, you know, music and having free of, you know, free events for like people. And so I think that's, that's like something that, um, needs to happen just like Renita was saying like it would be great you know we have people from all over the world right now going like in this like conference thing so why not have an art exhibition in conjunction with it so we're about a minute or two from time and I don't know if the platform cuts us off hard at the 115 marker so I'll just say by way of a summative thought um since um a couple of times during the conversation, uh, uh, art and climate change and art and different kinds of political concerns have come up. Uh, when you think about climate change, the problem of scale is often a huge one. And I would just, without like saying, uh, without trying to, here's what, here's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think it's worth thinking about when we talk about reaching people what's the scale on which visual art as a medium is capable of, of doing so and what are its effects? Um, it's when it comes to the climate emergency, it's very late in the day for consciousness raising, right? There is an invasion of Ukraine that took place last week that is it's motivated by a whole bunch of different things. And I appreciated Natalia's point about um, drawing on the past to look towards the future. If, if it was Natalia, it might have been somebody else. I apologize if, if I'm getting it wrong. Um, but these are in part wars about energy and, 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 and everything we know about the kinds of disruptions that are going to happen are not just in the natural systems of the planet, but these kind of um, bellicose political um, uh, things when there's fights over water scarcity and, and, and other things. So I'm 
trying to rush and say that quickly, but uh, I think it's worth thinking about um, what what is art actually capable of doing. And saying that as someone who I don't think I said a start, um, I'm an art critic and my background's in poetry. And uh, I, you know, like all of you, I've dedicated a big part of my life to these things and I believe in them. So it's not to dismiss the efficacy of it, but to think about um, what, what its efficacy might actually uh, be. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah, uh, and thanks to everybody, to all of our um, panelists, Jack, Natalia, Marsha, Fernita, and to the audience for your engagement and attendance. Thank you. Looks like we can keep talking if we want to. Yeah, it does. See, they're not hard cutting us off. So I, I, I gave my closing thought, but if people want to stay on and, and say a few more words, you're welcome. I have a struggle with this topic a lot because I'm not making work that's specifically about issues. And I, I did actually do a show, a couple shows about 10 years ago that were about coral reefs. And it felt like I was trying to twist my studio practice into propaganda. And so I did the best I could to make it be really about the art, but it still felt like there, not every artist is cut out to make work that's about these topics. Um, I think those who can and who are driven to them should certainly do it. But I don't think every artist needs to do it. I think the world needs all of us. And all of us. Yeah, those, those coral reef paintings are, are gorgeous. I I was looking at them uh, on your website. They really impressed me as being just beautiful works of art. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It felt like it felt like um, I've been making abstraction for a really long time and I only sold two of those. And it's like the, the verdict was coming back to me not to make, keep making that work. Um, I make a living from my work, so I have to sell things. And so it felt like maybe this isn't my forte. You know? Well, it is your forte, but it's nothing to do with selling. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it would have to be more of like a second a secondary body of work. But... Um, yeah, when I, used to, when I used to teach art classes, I would always tell this to my students, there's an audience for everything, but some audiences are smaller. And the, the visual art world is small compared to other parts of the world and different businesses and industries. The visual arts are small. So to feel like you know, you're going to be able to make major change through one exhibition is kind of reaching for the stars. Doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. Um, but I think that, like, I know in terms of music, for example, I need music that's not about words. I need to listen to music that's like ambient or, or whatever. Um, I'm glad people are making it. And I think that as a visual artist, I'm trying to give people something that's an equivalent of that in visual art. Having said that, I think that what's going on in the world always feels so catastrophic compared to what's happening with TV. And it feels like it, it's like just like two different things. And so it's hard for me to get my head around it sometimes. Uh, Beth, I, I gave Babs the mic again. It's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I hung up the mic, but uh, I just want to say I myself as, as an artist don't expect that I'm necessarily reaching uh, a, a wider audience. And I was wondering just if it, it's, it's a pure surprise when it happens. <clears throat> I'm making the work because I need to make the work and it's what I want to talk about and what I want to say. And so I was kind of, it, my question was really more about if it, it, it happens to you and if, if you think that there is the direction going that way. And I myself don't necessarily think so. I believe in art as an aesthetic, as that, that you're making the art as a visual. It's, it's, uh, the message is, in my mind, needs to be more, well, I don't want to say more subtle, but subtle and uh, that it's there and people have to come and if they react to it, potentially they may then themselves take action. But it's not my intent to necessarily uh, make them take action. It's more about inviting them to think about whether they wanna do something about this. 
Uh, so it, it's it's uh, you know there are people that are dealing with climate change that are that their their statements are at least I feel more obvious or they they go for these different venues they have not sought that with the exception of going to uh, university galleries or those are places that reach a lot more people and then you can have panels that deal with those things as, as well. And then I'll shut up because I'm not one of the panelists <laughs> and stick in my two cents in here. Uh, and so I'll mute myself. <laughs> no, Jack, that's such an important point because I've never had to, I've never had to sell my work to survive because I'm in academia and I taught for a long time. So I've never had the pressure of having to make art that sells. And I've, so I've always made art that had some, a deep underlying connection to what I feel strongly about. and. That that does affect what you, what you produce, of course, because if you need to make a living, you need to make other choices. Yeah, I mean, I think there are lots of artists that are making a living making their work that you've never heard of, um, but they're reaching their own audiences just and doing just fine. So um, it's funny. I know this this panel wasn't at all about women artists, but I wanted to mention that one of the things I think about when we about the future of American art is more women artists being supported at all levels. Um, look at, it's almost all women on this panel. It's when I was in school, it was almost all women. But when you look at who's getting supported at the upper levels of the art world, it's almost all men. Having said that, I also have all the galleries I work with right now are almost all owned by women. Um, there's women art consultants, women curators, women collectors in, you know, it's changing the face of what we're seeing because women have a different aesthetic sensibility um, than men do. And it's like my husband and I talk about this a lot because he has, he's a, a woke man and yet he still says these sexist things that I can't believe come out of his mouth. And so it's like, um, when is that going to um, affect the art world in a more profound way? Because women have a lot to contribute and different, a different voice. So that's one thing I'd like to see more in the future. Um, one comment on that. I'm on a panel later tonight, and it turns out we have the moderator is a man, like Lewis is a man, and the women, they're all women. <laughs> and the subject is about uh, affecting nature uh, with your art. But I'm just fascinated by that. It's like, I, I don't know, oh, all of the all of the panelists are women, which was interesting too. Okay, what what time is your panel, Babs? Um, it's at uh, eight forty five. Yeah, eight forty five. Bernita, did you want to say something? I I keep muting you because your when your thing is not um, muted, it gives feedback when other people are talking. So I'm not trying to stop you from talking. I'm just trying to make the, the sound. Uh, uh. Well, I just had a couple of comments about some of the things that have been said. I mean, they're sort of past now, but I would say that when I was teaching, I would tell my students, listen, if you want to make a living from your art, get a day job. Because as far as I'm concerned, really going out there and trying to sell art fucks it up, you know? It's, it's, you have to make it from your soul. Uh, so that was one thing. <laughs> um, the other was the idea, yeah, women, we are, we're getting more and more powerful. Maybe it was me too that's helped. And um, uh, I'm working right now on curating a, an exhibition for next fall of women artists who were working politically as artists in New York in the 70s because too many of them were forgotten or never got to the place that they should gotten to. Um, and another woman's artist organization is WEED, uh, Women Environmental, and I can't remember what the last two letters stand for, but it's for Women Environmental Artists. Yes, yes, good, thank you. So maybe that would be a good place to round off for the for the afternoon. Thanks again. 
uh, to all our wonderful panelists and to our audience for really, uh, I think the fact that we went over <laughs> testifies to um, the engagingness and passion of the conversation. So I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, and for everybody's participation. And uh, Lou, I wanted to thank you for that one poem you did, Ashes to Ashes. Do you remember? Uh, you, you totaled like all of the, uh, let me see if I can find it. I had it here. Um, ah, it was, was it published by, by the Brooklyn Rail? I'm, maybe, but it was things that, all the things that you had thrown away in 2015. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot more stuff than I expected. I kept a diary for a year where I did, yeah. where I did that. Uh, it was great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> nice to meet and see everybody. Okay, bye-bye.